Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to your friendly neighborhood atheist. I would like to welcome my uh, guest for today, Cy Ten Brugenkate. Cy, how are you doing? I'm doing I'm fine, thanks. Better than I deserve, actually. <laughs> oh, good. I, hey, I, I appreciate you uh, coming and taking the time to do this with me. It's my pleasure. Um, I, I would also like to apologize to you uh, because I did at one point uh, levy an insult at you in a previous video. It was actually one of my first videos. So uh, I, I do apologize for, for doing that. You know, the, the funny thing is um, we did talk about this because you said that you're the friendly neighborhood atheist you want to engage me. And I said I do my own research and I, and I found that clip where you had called me a child or something. And you apologized and I accepted that. But one thing I did ask you and you, you haven't answered yet. Are you apologizing for thinking I'm a child, a child or for calling me one? I would say both. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm human. I do make mistakes of, you know, judge, judging people too soon. And I, I don't think that was uh, appropriate for me to do. Appreciate that. Apology accepted. Thank you. Um, so, Sai, if you could, uh, could you uh, tell everyone about yourself and a little bit about your background? I'm basically a dude with a website. Um, I was born and raised in a Christian home in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I don't know when I was saved. Um, I don't say that I was born a Christian, but I was saved at a very young age. I have not known anything other than professing Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. There have been ups and downs in my walk, but um, I've never known in my memory of not being a Christian. Um, and I worked in a factory most of my life. Um, I worked in hospitals. I'm what you call a, a stationary engineer in Canada. That's a boiler operator. And I did that for over 20 years, shift work, the, the whole thing. My last job was at an automotive assembly plant. And um, I love sharing my faith with um, my colleagues at work. And um, what I discovered is that, you know, I got really good at these arguments. The uh, Christian, my fr Christian friends love them. But I would use these arguments with my unbelieving friends and I'd get them shoved down my throat. And I didn't know why. But um, after studying them, and actually, actually, actually after, by the grace of God, discovering what is known as presuppositional apologetics, which I'm sure we'll get into, I discovered that these arguments were actually terrible arguments, that they weren't talking about the God that I believed in. And by the grace of God, I was introduced to a debate called the, um, the Great Debate with a fellow named uh, Dr. Greg Bonson, a Christian, and Dr. Gordon Stein. And I believe you can find that on YouTube. And I watched that debate, and it uh, changed my world. And I became what is known as a presuppositionalist. And then I came to understand how to defend my faith in the God that I actually believed in, instead of the, tr the probability that most people represented. And I was so passionate about it that, um, well, I went to an evangelism conference from the church I was attending at the time, and I disagreed with 95% of what the speaker said. It made me want to puke. He wasn't talking about the God that I believed in. He was talking about a probability. And it wasn't that day, but I believe the next day I went to see the Ben Stein movie, Expelled. Okay. And they're talking about intelligent design. Now, I'm not a proponent of intelligent design. I'm a creationist. But at the end of the movie, uh, Ben Stein said, if we don't do something about this, who will? Anyone? Anyone? And I thought he was exactly right. You know, I cannot complain about the state of apologetics in this world unless I'm prepared to do something about it. So I believe it was the next day that I went to, to my boss and I handed him my resignation. And I was making over 100 grand a year at the time. You know, people think that I do this for um, that I do this for money. They have no idea. I mean, I was I'm a scuba diver. I used to scuba dive every year. I don't do that anymore. But now, uh, by the grace of God, I get to um, defend my faith with people like you and, and teach Christians how to talk about the God that they actually believe in instead of the God that the world wants us to represent. So, may I ask, was there uh, what specifically I, I, uh, that turned you into a presuppositionalist? Was there an argument you saw, or you know, what got you into it? Well, so I um, I started working on this website. My website is proofthatgodexists.org. And um, I had all these evidential arguments, and I had them down pat. I had them, you know, some of my Christian friends love them. And I made this point-and-click website, um, basically like mine is now, but it was evidential. And people were loving it. I worked on that. And then, like I said, I was using these arguments at work, and, um, and they were just falling on deaf ears. So I actually shelved the project for this website for about two years. It never affected my faith but it affected my desire to, to share my faith. I always had a strong faith, but I thought I'm not gonna share my faith because I just get it shoved down my throat. Right. And so it, um, I, I shelved it for about two years. And then, like I say, I was introduced um, to the debate called The Great Debate with Dr. Greg Bonson, and Dr. Gordon Stein. And I didn't know what happened, but I knew it was different. And um, you know, I probably listened to that time, that debate, I don't know how many dozen times, but every time I listen to it, I get something out of it. And I would, I would say that most people, especially of my age who get into this apologetic, probably started by listening to that debate um, by Greg Bonson and Gordon Stein. Um, it, it was just absolutely amazing. Gordon Stein did not know what hit him. Um, sadly, they both uh, have been um, dead for quite a while. There's actually, had a, they had an email exchange 
it wasn't email actually back then, but they had a letter writing exchange for quite a while afterwards. And um, at one point, because I, I have the exchange, and um, at one point, um, Dr. Bonson said to Dr. Stein that they should you know, publish these. And Dr. Stein said, if you publish them, we will sue you. But they're both dead. They've both been dead for quite a while. So American Vision um, has the rights to these letters. They have the letters anyway. So I hope someday they put them into a book form because then um, you know, people can really see the outworking of the apologetic, both in the debate and the conversation that ensued. And if you could, could you explain specifically what a presuppositionalist is? Yeah, okay. So one thing that I want to say to the people that are watching, I'm a factory worker. I'm not a PhD. I'm not a pastor. I'm just, like I say, an average dude. So when I try to explain things, I like to dumb them down to my level. I think that's one thing that God has gifted me with is taking these difficult concepts and dumbing them down to my level. So the way that I like to explain the difference between an evidential approach and a presuppositional approach is to give an example. And I say, let's say you took a uh, fossil and you put it between a PhD uh, who's a Christian and a PhD who's a non-Christian, a geologist on both sides. Now, the Christian might look at that fossil and, and say, um, no, it's flood, thousands of years. The unbelieving PhD might look at that same fossil and say millions or billions of years. Now, they have exactly the same evidence, but they come to vastly different conclusions. They're both PhD. They're both experts in their field, but they look at the evidence and they come to vastly different conclusions. Why? not because of the evidence. They come to different conclusions because of the beliefs they take to the evidence. And those beliefs, those foundational beliefs that we take to the evidence are known as our presuppositions. So if you present evidence to somebody who rejects God outright, then they're going to reject God as the explanation for that because you know they have a rescuing device. Christians have rescuing de devices as well. If somebody says dead men don't come back to life, I'll say, yeah, they don't, but the Bible says it happened in this instance. So we both have rescuing devices, so it makes no sense to argue evidences when we, we evaluate them according to our pre-beliefs, our presuppositions. So rather than do that, I expose that unless you approach evidence with Christian presuppositions, you can't even make sense of examining evidences. Because I believe that things like logic, science, and morality, these are tools of Jesus Christ. And what most Christians do is they give these tools to the unbeliever so they can argue against the Lord that we adore. And the example that I came up with, I say, if you had a nation that had all of the weapons and ammunition, and that nation was going to have a war with another nation. I say, when would that war start? That war would start when the nation, with all the weapons and ammunition, gave some to the enemy. Well, I'm not going to do that. These are the tools of Jesus Christ, and I will not give that them, them to the enemy so they can argue against Jesus Christ. I'll say, look, we'll have this discussion, and I don't mind having the discussion, but there are things that this, that this discussion require in order to make sense. And I say, well, as an unbeliever, those are the kind of things that I challenge unbelievers to, um, to give. Now, you got to keep in mind, I have these conversations away from the internet as well. I have friends at work and I, and I don't uh, say to them all the time, how do you know, how do you know? You know, I challenge them with the truth of their position, you know, with the justification, but then we have wonderful conversations about scripture. But um, I always preface it, or I, I, I try to preface it when I was working with the fact that when you bring up these objections or the difficulties with the Bible, you're actually borrowing these fundamental principles from God. And if they're willing to, um, you know, acknowledge that, then I'll discuss anything with them. As I also said in the movie, How to Answer the Fool, which um, I imagine you've watched already. And it's available for free or the Dutch price on uh, YouTube. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, I definitely did watch it. Um, I, I have a question about that uh, later on. So sure. how could, let's say right now I am talking to you and uh, someone who is Muslim and is also a, a presuppositionalist. How do I differentiate between the two and know well, which one is true? Well, the, the thing is, I would say you can't. According to your atheistic presuppositions, you can't know anything to be true. So um, how could I as a Christian? Quite simply, they reject the God of the Bible. Now, people often make the mistake of saying, well, how do you, okay, I see you got to start with a God, but how do you know it's a Christian God? That's a misunderstanding of presuppositionalism. We don't start with a generic God. We start with the God of the Bible, and we expose that if you do not start with that God, that your worldview is absurd. So how can you tell the difference? You can't. The Bible says you know the difference. So I wouldn't waste my time trying to explain to you how you can tell the difference when the Bible says you already know. Because um, when I approach an unbeliever, I want to believe what God says about them rather than what they say about themselves. And so when you say, how can you tell the difference? I say, well, you know the difference. Of course, you know, the Bible says that people suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Now, Greg Bonson was a PhD and he did his doctoral dissertation on the phenomena of self-deception. Self-deception is a real phenomenon. And people, for whatever reason, sometimes, you know, um, they have tragedy in their lives or whatever, but they have reasons to hate the God of the Bible. So they suppress the truth about him and they elevate other beliefs. That's why I never call 
the unbeliever a liar when it comes to um, their suppression of the truth about God. I don't say they're lying. I say what the Bible says. They're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. And I'm comfortable saying that because that's what the Bible says. And if you reject that, you can't make sense of anything. So uh, just for, for clarity, you believe I'm suppressing my belief in God. Is that correct? That's what the Bible says, correct. All right. So let's say I, I, I genuinely want to get to where you're at. How do I do that? Because personally, I feel like right now, if I just say, hey, uh, God, I, I know you're there, I feel like that would be dishonest for me to say. So how could I, I, I start walking uh, towards the same direction you are? Well, I would say you keep saying it until God either saves you or until he throws you into hell. I have a, um, I have a dear friend of mine, um, Dustin Seegers, and he said he read the Bible as an atheist for a year. He read it as an atheist for a year. Didn't believe a lick of it. But one day he was reading it and God opened his eyes and he saw the truth of it. So I'd say, well, you say you don't believe it. The Bible says you do. And I believe God over you. So I'd say, keep saying it. Pray to the God that you know exists because there's no hope outside of Jesus Christ. If you do, And I'm not a proponent of Pascal's wager. I'm not saying, you know, you better uh, take this chance. I'm saying the God of the Bible exists. People like you know it. You suppress the truth and unrighteousness. There is no hope in this world or in the next without Jesus Christ. And, you know, the Bible says that Jesus says, I'm the way and the truth and the life. People often talk about the way and the truth, but they don't talk about the life. There is no hope in this life without Jesus Christ. And that's why I do what I do. That's why I quit my job 12 years ago now to try and talk about the Lord that I adore, the Lord that saved me, um, a wretched sinner that I am. I sin every day. And um, but the, see, what I say to an unbeliever says the difference between me and you is not that I'm good and you're not. The difference is that I'm going to heaven even though I don't deserve it. Because Jesus Christ paid for my sin and I put my trust in him. And that's what I want for people like you because there is no hope outside of that. You know, those who know me personally know that the last year of my life has not been a picnic. But, um, you know, I know that the Lord works all things for the good of those who love him. And that's why, for example, when I watched my father um, in a nursing home for seven years lose both his legs to adult diabetes, paralyzed on one side, rotting away for seven years, died in agony with bed sores, and I could trust God and I could love him. And the thing is, so could my father. So I remember one thing, when the, the day that my father died, I was making funeral arrangements. And I said to the funeral director, I said, you know, in a way, I'm glad that my father's gone. And she said to me, well, uh, my mother had eight brain tumors, and I was glad to see her go too. I said, oh, you don't understand. I said, if my father wasn't a believer, I'd want him to live forever in that agony rather than die and go to hell. But because I know that he was a believer, that he put his trust in Jesus Christ, I was glad to see him go. My mother died last year as well, a believer as well. You know, I miss them dearly, but I'm happy for them. And, you know, that's the hope that we can offer in this world and in the next that, um, you know, without Jesus Christ, you have everything to fear for, for your death and for the death of your loved ones. And that's why, you know, I try to speak, speak the truth and love to them. Um, jumping back real quick. Did you <laughs> say if your, if your father was an unbeliever, you'd want him to remain in agony? Yes. I want him to remain in agony in this world for an eternity rather than die and go to hell because the, Agony in hell is going to be um, exponentially worse than the bed stores and the paralyzation and the lack of legs in this world. People have no concept of hell. And, and that's, you know, um, I heard this uh, pastor once. He said that um, he can't listen to a pastor preach on hell unless there's a tear in their eye. And people talk about hell so flippantly. But, you know, like I say, I'm not a hell and fire and brimstone type person, but there is a real hell that awaits people. And, um, you know, people suppress that truth and I don't want them to go there. And, um, you know, I want to do all that I can to speak the truth and love and the hope that God opens their eyes. So regarding Pascal's wager, um, mm -hmm. since you did bring that up in your movie and you, you had stated, and I please correct me if I'm misquoting you, that uh, if you have, you have nothing to lose, if there's no belief in God because you would just die and rot in the ground. Is that accurate? No, I repudiated Pascal's wager. Because in church, we say nothing can separate me from the love of the Father. Romans 8, 39, that's what Paul says. Nothing can separate me from the love of the Father. Tears streaming down our face. What a wonderful, comforting verse that is. And then we go to work the next day and we say, I could be wrong. But if I'm wrong, I die, rot in the ground, worms in my body. If I'm right, I get to go to heaven with God. If you're right, you die, rot in the, worm, uh, rot in the ground, worms in your body. If you're wrong, you go to hell. What have you got to lose? So the day before in church, we're talking about the certainty of God, that nothing could separate me from the love of the Father. The next day we go out in the world and we say, I could be wrong. Say that's not the God that I believe in. If you can, if you say in the world that I could be wrong, then you can't say in church nothing can separate me from the love of the Father, and that's why 
That's why I do this. And that's why I can understand when atheists watch most Christians defend their faith. That's why there's so many atheists out there. And I think, man, you'd make a wonderful Christian because you see the BS that Christians um, talk about when they talk about a probability. I'm not saved by a probability. I'm saved by the certain God of Scripture that everybody knows. So if, if you are wrong, um, wouldn't that be harmful wishing your, your father was in agony? For <laughs> It's an impossible hypothetical because now we're saying right and wrong. And I'm saying the concept of right and wrong don't make sense outside of the Christian worldview. So it's an impossible hypothetical. And okay. I can say with full confidence. Okay. So you're saying there's no possibility you're wrong. Is that is that correct? Not on that. Okay. Not on the existence of God and, you know, the eternal state of mankind with or without Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, regarding hell, I've heard a, a couple of different things. And one is that hell is only absence of God and not actual torment. Is that is that correct or is that incorrect? Well, that would be incorrect. God does not lose his omnipresence at the end of time. You know, people make the mistake of saying that um, uh, Satan rules in hell. Satan doesn't rule in hell. God rules in hell. I'm not saved from the wrath of Satan. I'm saved from the wrath of God. So I have people say to me, I can't wait to go to hell. I get away from that God that you profess. Got news for you. The separation from God in hell is not physical. It's relational. You will have no more hope to put your trust in Jesus Christ. So it's God that rules in hell. And yes, it will be an eternal conscious torment. I'm not an annihilationist. And it's a horrible thought. Don't get me wrong. Don't you think it would be more loving not to torture someone for an eternity? Well, the thing is, what I think is irrelevant. It's what, no, God, what God has spoken. Um, yeah, of course. Of course. Of course. I would, you know, could I do something like that? No, but I'm not God. I, I'm not perfect. I'm not the person who's being sinned against. People have no idea um, the greatness and the goodness of God. People ask, why do finite sins demand an eternity in hell? It's not because of the degree of the sin. It's because of the greatness of God. And I, I explain that this way because I do a street evangelism as well. And they say, well, how can a finite sin demand an eternity in hell? I say, well, let's say, um, you know, I go back to Canada and um, I have four brothers. Let's say I take a swing at one of my brothers and I miss. I mean, we laugh it off. Um, that's what brothers do. We joke around. Let's say when my mother was alive, I went up to her and I took a swing at her and I missed. My mother say, well, you know, Sai, that's a terrible thing. I'm going to write you out of the will. But let's say I'm doing some street evangelism and the police come up to me and say, you guys are too loud. You got to shut off that loudspeaker or whatever. And I take a swing at the cop and I miss. What's he going to do? He's probably going to put me in the cruiser, take me to court. Let's say in court, I take a run up to the judge and I take a swing at him and I miss. You know, I might go to jail. You know, like uh, to definitely be consequences for that. But let's say uh, the presidential motorcade is going by and I jump out of the crowd and I take a swing at the president and I miss. I can get shot or go to jail for the rest of my life. And I've done exactly the same thing that I've done to my brother. The difference of my punishment is not because of what I've done, because of who I've done it against. And the Bible says no sin can be in the presence of God. So the reason that finite sins demand eternity to hell is because of how good God is. Now, people don't like that. I say, fine, put your trust in Jesus Christ and you don't have to go. So I, I know you said you, you obviously can't be the, the judge of what you think is moral or not because that's a God, but wouldn't it be better if he had a more loving approach? <laughs> See, now, now that's, a mis, that's a mischaracterization. I would say that God has the most loving approach. I just don't understand it. See, there cannot be a more loving approach. God is the standard of goodness. He's a standard of love. I cannot have a more loving approach. If I say I would do it differently, it's because I'm an idiot. That's why. You know, um, people say, if I had the power of God, you could see, you would see all the things that I would change. But I've had, if I had his knowledge, I would change nothing. You wouldn't try and help people in another way? If I had the power of God, you, I would change many things. If I had his knowledge, I would change nothing. I guess I'm, I'm confused by that because I, I... Yeah, that makes sense. It makes sense because, you know, there are certain truths that, you know, people who reject God are not going to understand. But if I had his power, my finite mind says, yeah, I wouldn't want that to happen. I wouldn't want... I, Ethan, I wouldn't want you to go to hell for an eternity. You know, I would probably have some kind of system in which you wouldn't have to go. That's my finite mind. But if with the knowledge of God, I say, no, you must go. And you must go because God is so good. Now, why that is the case, I don't know, but I trust him. And the best times in my, in my life are when I trust him most. And the worst times in my life are when I trust him least. 
So I guess, okay, uh, maybe you can help me understand. Let's say right now, I, I personally, um, I, I'm saved by uh, God, okay? Just, uh, and I am getting to go to heaven. And then I find out one of my family members is going to hell. I couldn't wrap my mind around going to heaven knowing I have a family member suffering. Are, are you comfortable with that? Well, there, there's a quote, and it's a sobering quote. And I, I, you know, I've been looking for it for quite a while. If anybody in the chat or anybody any watches this can find the quote, but it was a, written in uh, the bottom of our bulletin when I was in Canada uh, many years ago. And it was a, a pastor who was writing to his children. And he was urging them to repent and put their trust in Jesus Christ. And he said, do not make me rejoice at your condemnation. Now, that is unfathomable that that a man would would rejoice at the condemnation of his children who he loves, who he loves dearly. I cannot imagine anybody saying that. And yet he's saying, do not make me rejoice at your condemnation because justice will not only be done, it will seem to it will be seen to be done. So you would not if you were in heaven and put your trust in Jesus Christ, you wouldn't look at your family member and say, oh, you know, God made a mistake. God messed up. I don't want to be here. It wouldn't be the case because you would put your trust in him. And justice would not only be done, it would be seen to be done. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I, I, I'm really trying so hard to understand this. I just... I well, let, let me help you out here. You can't. Sure. You can't. So I can save you a lot of time. You can't understand it. These things are folly to those who are perishing. That's what the Bible says. See, um, people make the mistake of trying to get unbelievers to see the truth so that they'll repent. You know, they, they give all these you know, great arguments, all these evidences, trying to get them to truth, see the truth so that they repent. What does 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25 says? In the hope that God grants them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. I'm not trying to get you to understand these things so that you repent and put your trust in Jesus Christ. You need to repent for your sin against the God you know exists, and then I'll have to explain any of this to you. Then it will make sense. That's how it works. Knowledge comes after repentance not before I, I guess okay so I, I I understand that I where I'm just still having trouble is from how I feel about the world mm -hmm. I take a more loving approach like I genuinely just want to help everybody I want to be there for everybody you know I am against capital punishment you know I I think we need prison reform like to me if we all just were a little bit more loving, the world would be a better place. Like, for example, uh, you know, Daryl Davis, he's, have, are you familiar with his work by chance? No. Um, he is a, uh, a black individual that would go to KKK rallies in support. Oh yeah, I did. I actually watched a, a documentary with him recently. I loved it. I thought it was great. It was like a seven minute thing on God tube. Actually. I saw that. It was you amazing. Know, right. Like he changed people's minds just by being their friend. Uh, imagine if, you, I, or even God did that. Like, don't you think the world would be better with that approach? Again, what I think is irrelevant, but the thing is, and like I say, we haven't got into an, a debate mode or anything like that, but when you say something is more loving, you're putting on a scale. You know, okay. if, if, if I were to ask you what's two plus two and somebody says five and another person says five million, I say, which is the better answer? And you'd say, well, they're both wrong. Yeah, which is closer to the right answer? You'd say five. Because two plus two in base 10 mathematics, the answer is four. So when you say something's more loving, you have to put on a scale. But I'm saying, according to atheism, one thing is it more loving than the other. It's just different. Because you need an absolute standard of loving and non-loving in order to say that something's more loving. So when you actually say that something's more loving, you borrow this standard from the God that you know exists, except that you skew it according to your presuppositions. So I guess... so. And just so I'm understanding correctly, the the only way I can unsuppress my belief in God is just talking to him. Is that is that no, I, you, you can't. You can't. Because the thing is, if I say, Ethan, you need to unsuppress um, your your view of God and you did it, then you could boast about it. Then you can go to your other unbelieving friends and say, I unsuppress the truth about God and you didn't. It's the gift of God so that no one can boast. So what you need to do is get on your knees and cry out to him and say, change my mind about who you are. That's what repentance is. People make the mistake of saying that repentance is something you do. Repentance comes from the Greek word metanoia, which means to change your mind. You need to change what you think about God. And if you change what you think about God, it will change what you say and change what you do. But the Bible says repentance is the gift of God. So you need to cry out to him, ask him to change your mind about who he is, until he does it or until he throws you into hell. But the Bible says also he casts no one away. So if people do this in sincerity, God will save them. 
so that almost sounds to me, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, like the placebo effect. If I just keep telling myself God is there, then I'll actually believe it. So how would I differentiate between actually connecting to God and the placebo effect of just thinking I'm connecting to God? Well, the Bible says that you know this God and you suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So I, I can't talk to you about a placebo effect. I had the opportunity um, a couple of years back to sit down um, with Paul Wash. He's a very famous Christian um, preacher, a, a wonderful man. And um, I said, one of the most difficult things that I have when I talk to unbelievers is that I don't know what it's like to walk the earth and suppress the knowledge of God. Now, Paul Washer was an unbeliever. He, he was a professing atheist, you know, through his college years, from my understanding. And he said the best way that he could describe it was a haunting. It was a haunting. He knew deep down that that was the case. So how can I make you appeal to that, you know, that, that what you know is the case? I can't. You know, I, I did, of course, when I when I um, engage people, I like to watch your videos. And I know some of your history. I know some of your past. Now, I know um, and I sympathize with you, uh, man. Like, I, I honestly sympathize with some of the things that you've gone through. And I know that you don't attribute those things to your atheism. But um, when people have tragedy in their life, when people have these things, then, I, you know, I think at a subconscious level, there is a way that it, it puts a barrier between you and that God. So, you know, I would not um, appeal to a placebo effect. I would just say, cry out to God. If you say that you don't uh, know that he exists, I can't help that. I'd say, just keep doing it until he, like I say, until he saves you, or until he throws you to hell. And people say, well, I'm not going to do that because I don't really know. Why should you do that? Why should you keep doing that? Because he's worthy. God is worthy to be praised. And if you feel that you don't know that he's there, I would say it doesn't matter. It does not matter. See, here's the thing. God hands people over to the suppression of truth. That's what it says in Romans chapter one. So someone who's your age, I can have this conversation with, and they might actually get down on their knees and, and cry out to God and ask them, ask him to change their mind. But what I find is that the older the people get, you know, that I get the finger from them. Oh, you're nuts. I don't want to even talk to you. But you've been, like I say, you've been a friendly neighborhood atheist, and I'm having this discussion with you. But the problem is you have a YouTube channel, a couple of YouTube channels dedicated to your atheism. And, um, you know, you're getting more subs, you're getting more views. And, you know, you're, you're replacing, I believe, uh, the knowledge of God, the satisfaction that you get in Jesus Christ with subs, with views. And the problem is that God hands people over to that. So that's why I would encourage you to get on your knees and cry out to him for repentance, because this will get harder and harder as you go along, as you get accolades from the people who are commenting here. You know, I, I saw the comments of your, you know, your, your video where you talked about depression. People, oh, eighth, and this is wonderful. You know, this is beautiful and stuff. And I understand how that makes you feel good, but it's a false hope. That's the placebo effect. You need to put your trust in Jesus Christ because he's your only hope, your only hope now and your only eternal hope. Because Jesus Christ didn't only die to save lives for eternity. He died to save souls and reasoning in the here and now. There is no life without him. So um, I just so it's clear, like uh, Larry, the Christian, uh, yeah. you know, a friend of mine, he asked me, like, what would happen to your channel if you became a Christian? And I immediately told him now. I know, or sorry, I, I don't know. From my understanding, you, you necessarily don't think I have a standard of honesty. I, I don't want to misrepresent you, but no, honestly, you have a you have a standard. Your standard is God. The difference is that I profess that standard, you suppress it. But I definitely think you have a standard. Okay. But I say without God, you can't have a standard. So okay, so just so we're clear, if if you or sorry, if God did convert me. I would immediately either give up my channel or rename this channel because uh, unlike I want to believe as many true things as possible. And if I'm wrong, I, I really do want to know, like I, if God's out there, Hey, I, I want to talk to uh, him, her. See the, the problem. Now, how do you want me to refer to you? Uh, Ethan, I, I know that you have different names on the internet, but I, well, how do you want me to refer to you? Ethan. Okay, um, Ethan, the thing is, and Matt Delahunty said the same thing. He wants to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible. But I'm saying the very concept of truth cannot be made sense of without God. Because in a godless universe, we're evolved pond scum. You, got, you don't get truth from evolved pond scum. You don't look at two weeds growing in a driveway and say that one's growing true and the other one's growing false. So when you say you want to believe true things, and I know that you got into this with Joel, but I say what is even a definition of truth and how can you know anything to be true without God? So when you say you want to believe true things, what's one true thing that you believe in? How do you know it to be true? 
And like I say, we don't have to get into the debate thing. I've done this all over the internet. We don't need to do that. But I'm saying that without God, you can't even justify the concept of truth. So if you want to know true things, then you have to turn to Jesus Christ, who's the very embodiment of truth. Well, you know, as I've, I've said before, uh, if if God is real, Jesus is real, I, 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 I want to know. Now, I don't know if I would actually, you know, worship him based on the things I currently know, or at least my current understanding. But if, if we're being totally transparent, the idea of seeing my brother again would be amazing. Like that would be truly awesome. Was but your brother I, was your brother a believer? Uh yes, he was. Okay. I, I come from a family of believers. Mm. Uh except for my other brother and I, we are both. Uh, now, if, my, if if your brother um died professing Jesus Christ as his, as his Lord and Savior. To live as Christ, to die is gain. It's pain for the people that are left behind. But like I say, I lost my mother last year, my father a number of years before that, and that's pain. But I'm thrilled for them. I mean, they're rejoicing with my Lord. I'm thrilled for them. Death is not an enemy to the Christian. I mean, um, that's why this whole COVID thing, you know, where, where people are, are freaking out about it and, you know, not going to church. It's the same sovereign God of the Old and New Testament. Now, do I want to live and, and profess Christ on this earth and to teach other people about him? Yes. But if he takes me from this virus, I don't care. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Okay. Of course, you know, it's different for me, too, because I don't have a wife and children. So, um, I mean, I know my church family is probably screaming at the, you know, sigh, you know, we don't want that for you. And they say that as well, but I'm not afraid to die. You know, if the Lord were to take me, it's the same Lord. And, you know, I think I've, this whole virus thing is hyped up anyways. But um, I'm not afraid to die, and death to the Christian is not an enemy. It's victory. So I actually, I did want to get into the virus, but before that, I wanted to jump back for something. Um, you had said that you don't think hope is, is possible without God. Is that? Yeah, there is no hope in this world or the next without Jesus Christ. So here's why I would disagree with you. The entirety, especially like the past year of my life, is all surrounded by hope like to me it, it's hope for a better future hope for change and hope that we as humans can do better like every day the best way to describe myself is like an excited child you know i i ride on my bike like a five-year-old so how do we explain that if i am suppressing my belief in god well I'll, I'll explain it very simply when you say hope for a better future again you're appealing to a standard better are, are we living in a perfect times now no so you want better times than what we're living in but according to atheism what is the standard of goodness it would have to be man and if man is the standard of goodness then we are living in the most perfect time now there's no such thing as better as an atheist you can't say i'm hoping for better times you have to say i'm hoping for different times you see the killing of jews is not worse than the non-killing of jews it's just different in an atheistic world now i can say that not killing jews is better because i'm a christian i have a standard of goodness but when you say you want better by what standard by what so, standard do you want better in this world or you know i understand atheists will say they want better and i get that but they're borrowing that standard from the god that they know exists i do want to just quickly correct you a atheism has no standard well, well, here, let me correct you then, because when people say they all I have is a lack of belief in God, that's fine. You don't have to prove your lack of belief, but you have a standard. You don't have to prove negative beliefs. I get that. But you're saying that without God, I can say things are better. That's something that you need to prove. You, you say that without God, I can have logic. I can have truth. I can have morality. I'm not saying that you need to prove your non-belief in God, but you, can, you need to prove that you can have morality without God, that you can have logic without God, that you can have truth without God, that you can have knowledge without God. And I'm saying that's something that people simply cannot do. And that's why I'm widely hated across the Internet, because most of these discussions, I hold people to that. Now, you've been friendly. You've been decent in this conversation. And you've been asking about some truths about Christianity. And I've actually really enjoyed this. But if it were to come down to, you know, your worldview versus my worldview, I would proclaim the truth. Of it, and I would actually expose the fact that you can't make sense of any of this without God. So, OK, let's let's say for a moment that you're correct, that I can't make sense of anything without God. Um, and I do want to just be clear that atheism uh, does not is, is not a worldview in any way. Well, no, no. The thing is, OK, let's keep this straight. Atheism, I grant it's not a worldview, but you have a worldview in which truth can be made sense of without God. So it's an atheistic worldview. I'm not saying atheism is a worldview and I don't care how people define what they believe. But you have a worldview. You do have a worldview in which certain things make sense without God. 
And those are the kind of things that if we get into this, I ask people to justify. But the more that I do this, the less philosophical I get, because that's not your problem. You know, like I'm, you see videos of me on the street talking about the preconditions of intelligibility. If the apostle Peter was standing beside me, he'd say, Sai, what are you talking about? I walk with Jesus. Tell them how to be made right with him. So the more that I do that, the more I shy away from the philosophy. But in a discussion like this, I will get into it. So I guess my, my follow-up question would be, uh, 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 would how do we know then your worldview makes sense? Like you're saying, hey, without God, this doesn't make sense. H how do you justify that or explain that? I don't need to justify it. God makes us know it. See, because here's the thing that people, and I'm, of course, you know, the unbeliever cannot really see the truth of it. But if I, if my just, if my worldview could have justification outside of my worldview, my worldview would be on the basis false. Because God, the God of the Bible is a necessary foundation to justify anything. And you say, justify that. I say, if I could justify that God is a necessary foundation for everything without appealing to God, my claim would be false. The necessary justification must be self-authenticating or it loses that justification. Um, I, I use the example of, um, let's say I had the uh, fastest truck in the world. And you say, prove that that's the fastest truck in the world. And I prove it by towing it down the racetrack. You'd say, um, isn't that tow truck faster? Or, you know, I, in my talks, I'll walk on the stage and I say, you know, um, um, I'm going to prove to you today that I'm the strongest man in the world. And what if they said, yeah, but don't use your strength? You know, that would be absurd. Ultimate authorities must be self-authenticating, but not all of them could be valid. I would say only one could be valid, and that's the God of the Bible. People simply do not understand ultimate authorities because my ultimate authority is God who is self-authenticating. Now, if you reject God, your ultimate authority has to be something else. And for the unbeliever, it's their own autonomous reasoning. I say prove the validity of your ultimate authority without appealing to it. And what's the first thing they do? They appeal to their reason to prove their their they appeal to their reasoning to prove the validity of their reasoning. And that's what you would call a vicious circle. And so I've heard you on a number of podcasts because I've seen them. You say, well, I'm not saying there's no God. I would really love to be, uh, believe in God. So you're what you would call a soft atheist. You believe that it's possible that God exists. Well, granting that possibility, you're granting the possibility that I can have knowledge because God makes us know things. So my worldview, which I say that you would know to be the case, has a foundation for knowledge, truth, science, morality, all these things. And whereas the unbelieving world doesn't, it has nothing. So I guess where I'm having trouble is, let's say right now, uh, you, me, a, a Hindu and a Muslim, we all get... Walk into a bar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Walk into a bar. We could all use that same argument. You know, you're just suppressing. And that, to me, sounds like it would be a vicious circle. So... Well, let, let me correct you there. It's not a reversible claim because I'm not saying, you know, I'm saying that belief in God is a necessary foundation for truth, logic. For example, logic is universal, is not made of matter. God does not change. God is universal. He's not made of matter. He's not, he does not change. So I have a foundation for my claim. Now, if you want to say that's reversible, you want to say, well, it's the lack of belief in God. That's the foundation for these things. I say, fill your boots. It's not a reversible claim. It's not an empty claim that I'm making. I'm making that claim and I'm supporting it with something like the preconditions of intelligibility. Philosophical argument, I get it. But then you would have to turn around and say, well, it's actually the lack of belief in God that is a necessary foundation for logic. I say, fill your boots. So are, are you saying the only way we could know anything is with, not just with God, but with absolute certainty? Because I, I don't think absolute certainty in anything is possible. Well, I saw your exchange that you had with Joel. And you know, when you say that, that's, an, that's a self-refuting knowledge claim. And I will not go down that path because... You know, you are making a self-refuting knowledge claim. But one, one thing I would say, and then you discussed it with Joel, one necessary element of knowledge is truth. I could not know that Elvis Presley is the current president of the United States because it's not true. So it has to be true. And I'm saying that, so I stick with that, that one element of knowledge. And I'm saying that you can't know anything to be true to any degree unless you start with God because it, it results in a vicious circle. And I've heard you talk about with Joel um, a definition of truth. And you would say truth is that which comports with reality. Now, I don't have a problem I, you know, with that definition. When I discuss with unbelievers, I have a more Christianized version of that definition. But when you say truth is that which comports to reality, I say, fine, how do you know it's real? And what does the unbeliever do? They, they, they appeal to their senses, their memory, and reasoning. I say, great. How do you know your senses, memory, and reasoning are valid? Now, this, they say, I don't know, or they appeal to their senses, memory, and reasoning. And it's a vicious circle. So when, you know, 
as far as certainty goes, as far as knowledge goes, I'm saying that you cannot know anything to be true. You can't even define truth without God. You can't even know anything to be uh, true unless you start with the God of the Bible to any degree. So forget maximal certainty. You can't know anything to be true to 0.0001% unless you start with God. So I guess last question on this topic, and here's why I'm confused, and uh, maybe you can help me out here. It just sounds like an, an assertion to me. Like I could flip this around and say, well, you can't know anything. So no, but that's that's fair. So I have a I have a revelational epistemology. That means that I believe that all things are known either by revelation from God or through revelation from God. And that's my foundation. Now, if you want to try and flip that, and I say, well, it's my you know I don't know. You haven't even given your your theory of knowledge, your theory of truth. And like I say, we can do this, but you know people are going to get bored out there. And I, I don't mind doing it. But if you and you said before, it's reversible. Show me how the non-existence of God accounts for truth, knowledge, logic, um, the uniform of nature, any of these things. And it's an impossibility. But then how could you show it from your side? Well, I, I will demonstrate that God is a necessary precondition for this. As far as showing it, God is universal as he has revealed himself in Scripture. God is not made of matter as he has revealed himself, and God does not change. Logic is not made of matter. Logic, the universe of logic does not change. I have a worldview that can comports with the laws of logic. Philosophical argument, I get it. But I don't have to show this to you because the Bible says you have sufficient knowledge of this God for your condemnation. So when people on the street say, me, uh, say to me, um, give me evidence for God, I say, well, which evidence would convince you of the God who says you already have enough? And when that person says, well, if he would give me this evidence, then uh, I would believe in God. I say, no, you didn't understand my question. The God of the Bible says you already have enough evidence. And if you say, well, I would need this evidence to convince me of that God, it, it's fallacious. See, becoming a Christian is not a matter of going to unbelief, from unbelief to belief. Becoming a Christian is a matter of going from suppressing the truth to professing it. And I cannot make you do that. Well, I, you know, I don't believe I'm suppressing it. Um, but I definitely well, that, want that's to that's 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 self-deception. That's the phenomenon. I'd encourage you to look up Bonson's dissertation and, and read it up. I mean, he has some wonderful stories on it as well. By the way, yeah, that uh, debate with Joel, I was not prepared for that. Like he, that was my introduction into uh, presuppositionalist, and it came at me like a truck. I he, was caught off guard. He's way nicer than I am. I guess I have been looking at the chat here. I don't know if he's popped up there, but he's he's much nicer than I am. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed. It. I think you've engaged him a couple times on your channel and uh, once on his, right? Yeah, he invited me on, and I I will say while Joel and I have very big disagreements he is a he's always been a nice guy to me and been supportive of what i do which i am your friendly neighborhood christian yeah <laughs> not, not there yet maybe maybe one day um okay no i was talking about joel oh okay yeah that's a good way to put it um i if you do have questions for sai uh, i'll get to them at the end just make sure you tag me in the comments and we'll go through and address those what are your thoughts on, on COVID? On COVID? Yeah. Um, I'm not afraid of it. Do you believe it's, so I guess, uh, let me uh, ask this a different way. There are many people that are in fact calling it a hoax. Do yeah, I don't think it's a hoax. I believe it is a deadly virus, but I think that it's, I think there's so much uh, politics uh, hooked up to this virus that I'm very skeptical of the reports. I think it's far less deadly than they said that it was. And, um, you know, there's biblical uh, mandates for um, outbreaks, for things like this, and it's, it's quarantine the sick, not the healthy. And I think the government seems to be going after the healthy. And I'm thinking if people are afraid of getting this virus, then, then they're the ones who should be quarantined. And um, so, you know, do I believe it's a real virus? Yes. Do I believe it's deadly? Yes. But there's lots of deadly things out there that we don't mandate that people change their behavior in order to, to mitigate it. And um, so I'm, I'm skeptical of the handling of it. I'm not skeptical of the virus. So do you, uh, and if you don't want to answer this, you don't have to, do you wear a mask? Um, I do as uh, little as possible. If if I put a mask on, it's when I don't want the hassle of having the discussion. And when I put it on, I put it over my chin or just over my mouth. I breathe through my nose. Um, so that's only when I can't be bothered with the argument. But um, 
I go to many places where I don't put a mask on. Um, I've had a bit of the flu last week, and I don't know if it's COVID light or anything like that. So in those circumstances, then um, I will cover my mouth. But here's the thing. You know, if I'm ever sick, if I sneeze or if I cough, I cover my mouth. But, you know, I think it's really ludicrous what people do out this because they have these flimsy masks on and, they, they, you know, they're rubbing their masks, they're rubbing their eyes, they're touching everything. And um, I was actually denied service in a, in a gas station around here. And this woman, uh, the manager came out and she wasn't wearing a mask. She was wearing this shield that she had angled out like this and her mouth was in direct, you know, contact with everybody. It's, it's really ludicrous what people are doing. So, so um, sorry, go on. Uh, no, so your uh, issue isn't with masks. It's that people aren't necessarily being responsible with them. Is that, is that correct? Well, no, I have some issue with the efficacy of masks as well. Plus, um, you know, there's there's definitely the people that are breathing it. Um, you know, they have a lowered oxygen content. And I'm saying if you're afraid of getting the virus, then you're the one who should be taking measures. I'm not afraid of getting the virus. So, sure. um you know, here's the thing. I, I liken it to let's say that um, you have a car. I, I'm not a, I'm not uh, opposed to speed limit signs, but I would be opposed to the government mandating me to put a governor on my car so it could, couldn't go any faster than a certain speed. I say, no, that's up to me. You know, so um, like like I saw somebody post on Facebook too. If you want me to be responsible for your health, then I'm going to stand outside McDonald's and slap those burgers out of your hands. So okay, a, a couple things. One, the uh, the oxygen thing. Uh, from my understanding, is a is a myth, and that's been well. There's there, there's videos on there of a guy. He has an O2 meter in his mask, and he, you know, I mean, it's not a myth. Clearly, I mean, I worked in um, industry for for many years. I've worn masks, and I know what it's like to have a deprivation of oxygen. And this guy, he wasn't faking with the meter. That's a it's a uh, it's a firefighter, and there is less oxygen. There's people been passing out. There's a, a guy that was in an accident because he was wearing an N95 mask in his car. So it does happen. But like I say. These are peripheral issues. You know, do I think it should be mandated? Absolutely not. I think it's a, a political ploy. So you, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that you've said this before, that you don't ever want to coddle people to hell. Right. Okay. okay. And you also stated earlier in this interview that uh, if your father was a non-believer, that you would want him to remain alive, suffering as long as possible until he became a believer. Is that correct? No. Um, well, of course, you know, I'd want him to, I wouldn't want him to die as an unbeliever, of course. Right. So knowing that there are unbelievers out there and you want them to become believers, wouldn't the responsible thing to do to be, to wear a mask so that you're protecting those non-believers? Well, the thing is, um, I'm a Calvinist. For those of you, um, you know, who are in the audience might be freaking out. God is sovereign. God's not dependent on my mask to save people. And the thing is, the hypothetical that I gave to my father was not to give him more time to be saved. He was saved. And God does not need me to give somebody time to be saved for God to save them. Nobody's going to be in heaven you know, because of me, and nobody's not going to be in heaven because of me. God's going to save who he's going to save, and my command is to be faithful. And I think that as a faithful Christian, I don't need to wear a mask. And, and God is not going to be thwarted to save somebody because I'm not wearing a mask. God's arm is not foreshortened by my wearing a mask or not. It's the same God of the Bible. It's the same sovereign God. He can do what he wants. And I'm saying that there's a mandate in Scripture on how Christians are hard to behave. And I'm saying that this goes beyond that mandate. So, okay, I get you. You necessarily don't want it to be mandated, but you don't see the importance of wearing a mask to protect, you know, your fellow person? No. I guess I'm confused by that. Well, that's fine. Do you wear a hazmat suit when you go out? No. How dare you? A hazmat suit isn't the same as a mask, though. It's, I know it's much more effective. True, but so uh, why don't you why don't you wear a hazmat suit? A mask is shown to. Uh, do you, do you, do you, so you're saying that a hazmat suit isn't the people who are dealing with this virus in these labs are not wearing flimsy surgical masks with their shirt pulled up over their face. They're wearing oh, yeah. hazmat suits. Correct. You know, the thing is that if if we are supposed to take these draconian measures to prevent deaths of other people, never get in your car again. I mean, that's what I'm saying is the inconsistent application of this. I think it's, you know, to try and rule the masses. And I am not for that. Okay. How is asking someone, because here's how I look at it. The, the world's just saying, hey, we need you to care about your fellow person. Can you put on a mask? Okay. Then I would say to them, you, okay. care about, you care about the millions of babies that are killed in the womb. 
And if they don't, then I'm saying, why should I take direction from you about caring for other people when you don't care about the slaughter of innocent babies? Now, I watched one of your things, and you said that when you became an atheist, you became pro, uh, pro-abortion. Pro-choice. Pro, yeah, well, pro-choice pro for um, the slaughtering of babies. Now, one thing you said is that life is the most important thing. It's, it's, I think I even wrote it down here. It's, it's to be... Life is to be preserved at all costs, above everything else. Mm -hmm. Now, if I were to say to you, well, how can you be um, pro life? How can you be pro choice if you say that life should be preserved above all? Because you would say, well, I believe the woman's right to choose is more important than life. I mean, uh, that's yeah. the absurdity. Let me, right? uh, let me address that real quick. So, no, well, okay. So I am pro choice. It doesn't mean I am a, a proponent of telling everyone to go get abortions. And in my own personal life, if I did get a woman pregnant, I would ask that she would at least consider not having an abortion. But I don't feel it is my right as a human being to force her to not have an abortion. Because well, then, then never say again that life is the most to be preserved at all costs, above all. Never say that again because it's false. That's So I would disagree with you there. Um, well, OK, what's more important, the life of the baby or the choice of the mother? So it all depends on how we're defining life, because, for instance, you know, obviously I would not be OK with at eight months in someone having an abortion. Yeah, but the day before you would. I mean, come on. It, it's an absurdity. You know, it's life. I don't have to. When I go outside at the abortion mills and I do go there quite frequently, I never argue the science. I think it's a to argue the science is to be duped by people. I mean, people out there know it's alive. And one of the examples that I actually quite like is let's say that you were part of a bomb demolition crew. And it was your job to search the building to see if there was anybody in there. And the foreman says, you know, go out there, search the building. You come out and you say, is there any life in there? You say, I think so. Um, I, don't, I don't think so. You know, there might be, but I'm not sure. Would it be irresponsible of that guy to push the plunger and bring the building down? Sure it would be. And you have a very loose definition of when life begins, maybe eight months, maybe a day before. And the, the, the fact of the matter is that's an absurd position to take, that even if there's a chance of life. But I don't say that because I'm saying that, you know, from conception, it is life. And you don't value that more above all things, like you say, according to your, uh, to your view. You value other things more important. And, you know, because I, trust me, I've had this conversation many times. Mm. But, but before um, sentience or whatever, and let's say, you know, uh, two months into the woman's pregnancy, you would probably um, say that she could have an abortion. But let's say a woman is pregnant um, and uh, two months, she's two months pregnant and she has a, a baby developing within her. And she sees on the news that if you have a, a disabled child, you can receive tax benefits for the rest of your life. So she asks a surgeon to put her under an anesthetic to open up her womb and uh, to uh, take the legs off her baby. Would that be ethical? Would that be okay? Seems like you're appealing to extremes there. Of course. Yeah, I am. I, I, that's, that's right. I do ex appeal to extremes to expose the folly of a world. That would be wrong, wouldn't it? Of course it would be. Why? Because you're cutting off the legs of uh, another of? being, you know, uh, uh, of a being of a clump of cells. However, <laughs> okay, so thanks, man. I not be okay with that. Um, but you'll be okay. You'd be okay with them killing it at two months. It, it's not that I'm okay with it. It's that I value bodily autonomy. So right. So, so you. you could have an abortion at two months, but you couldn't take the legs off the baby at two months. That's a glaring inconsistency that shows that. You know, it, it, it's just absurd. People don't value life. And I'm going to get people like that who don't know the difference between genders. You know, it, I, they're going to tell me the science behind a virus. No, thanks. Yeah, I, I definitely don't want to touch base on that. Um, so before we get to the audience questions, um, if you do have any, tag me. We'll go through them in a moment. I do have a, a couple of different type of questions. What is your favorite movie? Um, hmm, my favorite movie. I like the Die Hard movies. One, you know, I haven't watched it in a while, but um, I, I like Tootsie, actually. Dustin Hoffman, I liked that one growing up. Um, now, one th movie that I have recommended, but um, that was when I was less sanctified. I, I watch it now, and I shudder at the fact that I recommend it because there is blasphemy in it, and there's some uh, less than um, Christian themes. But uh, I really, at that point, uh, enjoyed The Princess Bride. You know, uh, comedically, it's brilliant. Sadly, there's things that I cannot, uh, I can no longer recommend it. But um, comedically, it's a brilliant film. And what 
what type of music are you into? I don't listen to a lot of music, although somebody um, posted um, today on Twitter the most melancholic uh, song, and I listed three of them. And uh, one of them was uh, Eric Clapton's Tears in Heaven, which I think is a, you know, a very nice song. And one was uh, Diary by Bread, you know, very melancholy and uh, just listening to it. I mean, the emotion that it evokes. And one of them is by a Canadian band called uh, Great Big Sea. It's uh, How Did We Get From Saying I Love You? To I'll see you around someday. And I'd encourage people to, li to look that up. Great Big C, it's a, a great band. So I like that kind of music. There's a band in Canada called uh, Little River, uh, not Little River Band. Uh, Little River Band is an Australian band that I like, but there's one called uh, Blue Rodeo. And I, I like that kind of music. Okay. And then I, I also like hymns too. Like uh, I have a, a, a disc of Psalms in my car that I love uh, listening to. My, my friend Ivy Connerly actually, he did the rap songs for um, the film How to Answer the Fool. And uh, debating Dillahunty, and um, I told him that it gave me the white man's overbite. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, uh, for one, speaking of rap, I like to rap. I'm like the, oh, yeah? uh, the cheesy white boy rapper. Yes, I, I <laughs> love karaoke. Um, what do you like to do in your in your spare time? And have you ever karaoke, or would you? Um, I don't believe I've been to karaoke, but I've not taken up the mantle. One thing that I did, like I say, when I had the money to do it, I was a scuba diver. Um, I enjoyed doing that. I love uh, fellowshipping with the saints. Um, the pastor of this church uh, that I'm attending down in um, Texas here, uh, Jonathan Murdoch, he has a, a bass boat and we've been out fishing a number of times. And I should say we've been out fishing. I haven't been catching. I've been fishing, but I, I've been enjoying it. I love the water. Um, it's my dream to live on the water someday. I, I want to live in a house with no road in between me and the water. It doesn't have to be a beach or anything, but I want to be right on the water. And um, I love the water. I was a lifeguard um, for much of my uh, teen life. And um, yeah, anything to do with water, I really enjoy. Okay. Yeah, same. I, I, I love the heat and I love the water. Um, are you, you had said you're not married yet. Is that something you're ever, ever looking for or... Well, I stopped looking for that um, many years ago. Um, I used to look after my mother in her home uh, for uh, 13 years. And she, like I say, she passed away last year. So um, I um, actively um, dissuaded that kind of um, endeavor during that time because it would have taken me away from caring for my mother. And um, I don't consider that a burden. I consider that a blessing. And now that uh, that's done, I'm open to the prospect. And um, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Um, awesome. So a uh, question from Rick Lockhart. Uh, he is a, I was about to say fellow Christian. He would be, uh, uh, well, he is a Christian. Um, two questions for Cy. What is the definition of sin and what is your definition of truth? Well, sin, um, according to scripture, is lawlessness. Um, so when I'm on a campus, though, I will explain to people what sin is. Because it's one thing to call something sin and uh, not tell people why it's sinful. And I'll ask that question when I'm on a campus, why is stealing wrong, for example? Okay. And people will say, well, it makes your boss mad because you steal his laptop, or it makes your neighbor mad because you steal a snow shovel. I can't really use that analogy down here in Texas. But they'll give all these different reasons. They, they say it's wrong because it's illegal. And I say all of those you know, are, are true things, but that, that fundamentally is not why stealing is wrong. Stealing is wrong for one reason, and one reason only is because God is not a thief. And we're created in his image, as this is in Genesis 1, And Ephesians 5, verse 1 says, be imitators of God. So lawlessness is when you, um, when you go against the nature and character of God. The law of God is actually the nature and character of God. Um, 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 the Apostle Paul has said in Scripture, I love the law. David in the Old Testament said, I love the law. He didn't love an arbitrary set of commands. He loved the nature and character of God. So the nature and character of God is is the law that we're supposed to uphold. So why is adultery wrong? Not because it destroys marriages, which is a terrible consequence. That's not primarily why it's wrong. Not because it destroys families, which is a terrible consequence. But adultery is, pri adultery is primarily wrong because God is perfectly faithful. And when you commit adultery, you call God an adulterer. When you steal, you call God a thief because we're his representatives. We're supposed to imitate him. And that's why those things are wrong. So sin is lawlessness and law is a violation. Uh, lawlessness is a violation of the nature and character of God. As far as the definition of truth goes, um, the definition that I used to like best was one from R.C. Sproul and uh, his group who would say, uh, truth is that which comports with reality. That's the standard definition of truth. But when you say comports with reality, according to who? There had to be a, an observer. 
um, that didn't differentiate. I'd be a perfect observer. So the definition of truth that they came up with is truth is that which comports with reality as perceived by God. But I felt that that um, added an unnecessary step. Of course, you know, as a, um, you know, not a smart guy myself, I didn't quite see that until I heard uh, uh, Bonds' definition of truth. And he said, truth is whatever conforms to the mind of God. And quite basically, truth is whatever God says. So that's what I would say is a um, Christian definition of truth. But I, for the purpose of conversation, I have no problem with um, truth is that which comports with reality. And I have no problem with truth is that which comports with reality as perceived by God. Um, question from Gonna Go For It. What reasoning did you use to determine that you had a revelation from God? Sorry, I uh, you broke up a bit there, or maybe I was chewing my eyes, but uh, what was the question again? Uh, yeah, from Gonna Go For It. What I, I've actually engaged him on his channel. I think he's from Holland. Yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. um, what reasoning did you use to determine that you had a revelation from God? Yeah, I, God makes us know. I don't use um, reasons to make that determination. I'm saying God makes us certain of that. That's, you know, how it is uh, in Scripture. When somebody says it's not impossible for God to exist, I don't have to explain how God makes us know things. I don't know how he makes us know things. But the fact is the God of the Bible, according to the Bible, makes us know things. It makes us all know things, myself and, and you included, and him too. A uh, question from Christian J. Watkins, a uh, new atheist on the scene. Highly recommend checking him out. Uh, Sai. It's not would, good for you, man. It's not good for you. What's not good for me? Telling people to check out atheists. Why not? Don't, it's, it's a thick, these kind of, and I, mean, I know we kind of talked about it a little bit before the show, but um, when you um, advocate for atheism, you're actually adding to your condemnation if you die unrepentant. It's not good for you. You know, like you say that if you became a Christian, a Christian, you should end your show. I say you should end your show now. You should not have a show where you advocate for uh, the non-existence of God, the God that you know exists. See, there are degrees of hell according to the amount of truth that people get and reject. And you're getting a lot of truth. You had Joel on here. You have, you've talked with other Christians. You're getting a lot of truth. And the more truth that you suppress in unrighteousness, the worse that it will be for you at the day of judgment. So, you know, I would encourage you not wait till you're a Christian. I would, of course, you're not going to do that. You're going to keep promoting your show. You're going to keep having guests on. You're going to keep doing this. But, you know, the, the sad thing is that this could be the worst day of your life because, you know, you'll when when you hear truths like what I'm sharing with you today, you'll have to go either one of two ways. You'll have to either suppress it more or you'll have to embrace it. And when you um, advocate for atheism, for somebody else's channel, for your channel, then you're going in the opposite direction. That's very dangerous for you. When I'm, when I'm preaching at the campus and, you know, people look at me, who's this freak out here preaching? I say, plug your ears, man. Plug your ears, keep walking. Don't stand here and listen to me. Because if you die unrepentant, this is not good for you because I'm giving you truth. And people who come on this show are giving you truth. And if you're rejected, if you die unrepentant, it's not good for you. So, yeah, this would definitely not be the worst day of my life. I have had the worst days. Um, no, but the thing is, you can't make that determination because I know that you'll say that grief in the past, but that I don't believe will affect your standard, your standing before God more than an open rejection of truth that a Christian comes in and shares with you. Now, I get it. I get it. From your status, you'll say, well, I've had worse days. I've had loved ones who have died. I get that. I understand that, and I sympathize with that. And I'm not saying that you're going to agree with the fact that this might be the worst day of your life. But in retrospect, when you stand before the God of the Bible and you say, I just didn't have enough truth, you know, it's not going to be a, um, a court case when you stand there. It's going to be a sentencing. But God has given you enough truth, and certainly today. Um, so uh, to get to uh, Christian's question, um, can you justify your God claim without appealing to your God claim? If you say that it isn't a circle, then justifying reasoning by appealing to your reasoning is fair. No, it is a circle. It's a valid circle. I'm saying all ultimate authority claims must be circular or they lose that authority. I'm saying God must justify himself. But the thing is, God is not in the same temporal realm as us. When somebody says it's not impossible for God to exist, they have granted my position for certainty, for knowledge, because God makes us certain. That gets me out of the circle. Because you say it's not impossible for God to exist. Fine. God makes us certain of things. Now, what's your justification? I use my reason to justify my reasoning. That's a vicious circle. There is no escape from the circle for the, for the unbeliever, but there is escape from that circle for the Christian. God makes us certain of things. Okay. Um, question, uh, is Sai afraid of Yahweh? 
Um, one thing that I pray is to fear him more. Now, I know, and you talked about with Joel, that fear is defined as scripture as the greatest respect. But the one thing growing up in a Christian home is that the thing that I, I uh, loathe most in my life is the complacency. And when I'm complacent, it makes me, uh, I think, more um, more susceptible to, to sinning. So I, you know, I loathe my complacency. What was the question again? Sorry. Oh, um, if you fear Yahweh. So do I fear God? Um, I fear him in that I respect him. Um, that's one thing growing up in a Christian home that's done uh, to me because um, this is an example that I gave. If you are um, are um, adopted into a billionaire's home when you're 20 years old, you might say, hey, look at that Ferrari in the garage or look at this granite countertop with the silverware. You might be all gung-ho, but you'll also wear a Jesus is my homeboy shirt. You know, you'll put your feet on the coffee table. Well, I grew up in a home where Jesus' love was lived and shown and I have a, a respect, you know, for that God. So do I fear him? I fear him in that I respect him, but I wish I was more afraid of him. Interesting. Yeah, I, I couldn't imagine wanting to be afraid of someone. Yes. Well, the thing is, because um, I think it would help me um, to sin less. Okay. I mean, the thing is, I, I try to sin not out of fear for him, out of love for him. I mean, if, if a man gives his wife uh, flowers, it's not for fear of, repu uh, of fear of uh of you know how she's going to react to not getting flowers. It's out of love. So I try to behave in such a way in thankfulness for what was done for me. But you know everybody has pet sins, and um, I you know I I think that if I had more of a fear, more of a gen, more of a respect for God, um, more of a, a terror of the God. See, um, there there's a word, um, the word awful. Awful used to be um, a positive word, and that God was awful. He's full of awe, and I want more and more of that fear of the greatness and, and the majesty of God. Okay. So, I mean, it's, it's a fine line between terror, actual fear, and just a, um, a, a great respect. You know, I have a respect for God, but I would say that every time I sin, it shows my lack of respect for God, and I just want more of that. And I ask people who are watching this to pray for that for me, to, to pray for God to crush the complacency in my life that I might love him more and serve him better because of who he is and what uh, he has done for me through his Holy Spirit in the death, burial, and resurrection of his son. Okay. Um, uh, next question from Korak. If I can't know anything unless I start with God, wouldn't that mean that I can't know that I can't know anything unless I start with God? Or is it just not know anything but no. God? That, that, he makes a very good point. When I go to a campus, I say, I'm presenting you an option today, Jesus Christ or absurdity. And people often choose absurdity because, you know, they love their sin. So, you know, somebody will say, well, uh, can you be wrong about everything they claim to know? I, they say, yes. I say, we can be wrong about that, too. So you're right. You know, rejecting God, it's just the um, infinite regress of absurdity. Um, if God is going to do whatever he wants, then why have you dedicated your life to preaching a foregone conclusion? Because God is a God of means as well as a God of ends. And I explain it this way. I believe that God foreordains everything comes, that comes to pass. Now, if I were, for instance, to believe that God foreordained that I have a full stomach tonight, it would be absurd for me to say, well, I'm not going to eat because God has ordained whether or not my stomach is going to be full. Well, no, the reason that I preach is that God uses means to accomplish his ends. God uses my eating to fill my stomach. He uses my preaching and my praying to save people. He doesn't have to. God can fill my stomach without my eating, but the normal means that he has chosen to fill my stomach is by my eating. God can save people without, without me preaching to them, without me praying to them, but God has condescended to use a worm like me for his glory, and that's a beautiful thing. I mean, that gives me goosebumps just thinking about it, that he has condescended to use someone like me to save people like you. And that, I mean, I love him. I, I can't imagine that he would use someone like me for that. Uh, so jumping back, uh, and this is a question from the Blazing Wizard Pope. I'm kind of paraphrasing here. But if you are a pro-life and you want to save lives, why not just wear a mask? Well, first of all, I'm not, um, I mean, pro-life has a uh, connotations. I'm an abolitionist. I believe that um, abortion should be ended. And um, the reason that I'm pro-life, that I'm an abolitionist, is that I believe that abortion should be ended because I believe that that life has value and that life is innocent and that life cannot protect themselves. People who are afraid of the virus can protect themselves. And if they're afraid of the virus, stay home. 
so let's say you there is uh, you walk by an area where there are significant people older community and they're you know above their sixties who whose health is at risk. You wouldn't be willing to just put on a mask. Oh, I absolutely would, if, especially if they asked me. I mean, if I'm going through a chemo ward, you know, I'd put a mask on. I absolutely would. But to be mandated by it, that's when I have the problem. But when it makes sense to wear one, sure. But I think that in most of the cases that the government is talking about, makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, when the government puts out a mandate that you can't go to church, um, but you can go and you can stand in a BLM protest, side, shoulder to shoulder, and that's okay. I mean, there are, are news clips of people saying, well, protesting is okay, but you can't go to church. It's absolutely insane. And I would be more inclined to trust the government if they were to put these things out consistently, consistently and if they cared for all life, but they don't. Yeah, I, th I think I, I can draw a, a line here. So for example, when I, when I went to one of the protests, it was outside. So the, the risk of spread is, you know, minimal. And additionally, everybody, including myself, was wearing a mask versus going to churches inside and people aren't necessarily. Well, first of all, look at the videos. And secondly, they were banning drive-in churches. I mean, it's absurd what they're doing. <laughs> they were banning drive-in churches. I mean, it's it's definitely, it's, it's um, the laws are not, I mean, they're not even laws, but they're not being equally applied. Okay. Um, question from Joel. No, no, but nobody was being arrested or, or being told in these protests to put on a mask and not everyone's wearing a mask. Well, the Antifa people were, but I don't think they're doing it for health. They did it long before this virus ever came out. Well, there were, like I said, I, I, I went to a few personally and I, I would say just an estimated guess, 90% of the people were wearing a mask and, be, you know, observing social distancing. <laughs> um, Question. I think it's funny. You should look at just look at the pictures, man. Shoulder distance. They were shoulder to shoulder. Look at the ones in LA. I'm not saying that they're. I think, you have, a, I think you have a bias. Uh, well, I was actually at these protests, so definitely not a bias. I was. And they were keeping six feet apart. I don't believe you. Show me pictures. No, no, no. I'm not saying every single person was doing that, but I am saying that the majority was absolutely wearing a mask. Um, <laughs> one of the only people I saw without a mask was someone who said they didn't need one because God was protecting them. However, the, the majority of the people with uh, Rick Lockhart is in the comments. He can verify this. We're being responsible. Well, you know, that that's, that has a presupposition uh, tied to it. I'm saying that I'm being responsible. But I'm, the I'm, thing is, of the two of us, only one of us can, adjust, can justify the concept. So, Okay. Um, question from Joel said a case for me. What evidence would convince me of the existence of God who says you already have enough evidence. <laughs> I, you know, I haven't seen enough evidence yet um, that at least would convince me. Uh, so, you know, by all means, I'm going to keep searching and looking and, and talking to people like Cy and many others, because if, if I'm wrong, I absolutely want to know. Now, now, Ethan, you understand though, that when somebody says, what evidence would convince you of the God who says you have enough evidence? Saying you don't have enough evidence, it's an absurd response to that. You'd have to just deny the premise of what he's saying. Let me the, God of the, Bible, the God of the Bible says you have enough evidence. You'd have to say no evidence can convince you of that God. He just doesn't exist. It's Let impossible me, for, him to, to, for uh, him to exist. I have not seen enough evidence. So, okay, but the God of the Bible says you have. Sorry, so can you I? Would have to, you would have to reject him outright. Finish my thought, please. Sure. Um, I have yet to see enough evidence. Now, I'm not saying the evidence is not out there, but I, I just haven't yet observed it or read it. So I personally would either need to continue reading or find sufficient evidence. But you realize you're not addressing the question then. If he says, what evidence would convince you of the God who says you have enough? You would say, I reject him completely. I'm saying it's impossible for him to exist. But you won't take that stance because it will destroy you know, your position on atheism. But the God of the Bible says you have enough to say, well, I don't have enough. You know, then you have to, then to be logical, you have to say it's impossible for the God of the Bible to exist. Then that's the logical response. Are you sorry, you're saying the logical response is to say God. Sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah. If you, the question is, what evidence would convince you of the God who says you already have enough? You'd have to say it's impossible for him to exist because I don't have enough. That would be consistent. But to say, well, I need more evidence, it would just be to you know deny the premise of the question. Okay. Well, yeah, if there is, <clears throat> then maybe there's something missing. 
I'll, I'll say that, or maybe I just haven't read it yet. Um, all right, Sai, where can uh, everyone, oh, uh, one more thing I wanted to jump back to what you said. Um, you had said that I shouldn't continue this channel and should immediately shut it down. I say, I personally don't like shutting down opinions. Like, I think these conversations need to happen. Right. Many the thing is, if, if I had a channel, I don't know if you're a married man, but if I had a channel that was based on insulting your wife, you'd say, Stop. shut it down. Ah, you cut me off again. I know I did. I, I think I've been pretty respectful. Could you just... No, that, that's that's fine. But but the thing is, I I'm just want to help you uh, with your thought. But go on. Okay. So um, I am against shuttering voices. So... For example, there are several people that were like, don't talk to Sai, you can't give him a platform. And I don't agree with them either because I want to have these conversations. So personally, I, I don't agree with you at all when it comes to shutting down a channel because this is how we, we learn. This is how we move forward, you know, engaging in these healthy conversations. But, but Ethan, when I say that to you, it's a logical claim that I'm making because this channel is an affront to God. So I'm saying that's why you should shut it down. You're saying, well, there should be dialogue. If somebody had a channel that, that was dedicated to calling your wife a prostitute, and if you said, well, you know, I think that we should have that dialogue, whether or not she's a prostitute or not, I mean, that would be insulting to your wife. You would, your wife would say, tell the guy to shut it down. Don't you love me? And I say, I love the Lord, my God. I love Jesus Christ. I love his Holy Spirit. And when you have a channel rejecting that God, I'm saying, shut it down. And I, I'm saying that that's not to suppress dialogue. It's for your good. So, yeah, I because I love you that I'm saying shut it down. Yeah. I, I know you won't. I get that. But no, def definitely not, because I, I really love doing this because, um, because you love your sin. You love to be God rather than to honor God because you hate him. I, I do not hate anybody. Well, you I, hate God. You hate. That's what the Bible says. Um, no, I, I definitely don't hate God in any way. I just I don't I haven't seen reason to believe he exists yet. Well, the Bible says you hate God. You say you don't. Who do you think I'm going to believe? Well, I, I guess you'd believe God assuming the Bible is true. I, I don't assume the Bible is true, but I would like to. OK, OK. If we're going to do this, we're at the end of this now. You okay. don't believe the Bible is true. What is truth? And how do you know anything to be true in your worldview? I and this is an area where I'm bad and I'm not even going to pretend that I can. Do right. It. But when you say that you don't think my worldview is true, then, you know, it takes me like two seconds to expose the fact that you're making a claim you can't justify without God. And I'm not saying that you're going to be able to see it, but you need to get on your knees and cry out to him to change your mind. Well, I will, I will definitely take that under advisement. I, you know, if I'm wrong, like I said, I want to know. Um, anyway, Sai, where can everyone uh, check you out at? My website is proof that God exists with an S.org. My uh, YouTube channels, I have one proof that God exists that is mostly my um, open air preaching, and, and I think I have some debates on there. And then I have a channel called Answer Anyone, where uh, my film How to Answer the Fool is on there, and also documentary debating Dillahunty. And I started a series where um, I've been answering people, but like I say, my life has not been great the last year, so I have kind of neglected that, but I hope to get back to uh, doing that, where I will um, provide answers to the typical questions in the um, typical, um, usual high profile atheist that uh, is out there and people don't really know how to engage them. And I hope to do that from a biblical perspective. And um, yeah, you know, I, I understand why people don't like me, but I'm out here because I love you and I want to speak the truth and I don't want to coddle people to hell. If I've offended you, um, you know, I will apologize for offending you, but I don't want to do that. You know, if I did that um, in any way that was uncharitable or unchristian, but um, like I say, I would rather offend people than offend my God. Um, I love him. He saved me. I don't deserve that. And that's what I want for you. And that's what I want for, for uh, everyone who's walking this earth who does not know him. I want to, them to know the love and the peace which passes all understanding by put their trust, putting their trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. So thanks a lot for having me on. No, th uh, thank you for uh, coming on, Sai. I appreciate it. Um, I, I would like to thank my uh, patrons real quick. Um, Mar sorry. Uh, Cindy Plaza, Trina DeLuca, Kenneth Leonard, Christian Watkins, Kathy Leto, Ian Davenport, Paul Damon, Edith. You uh, all are awesome, and I really appreciate your support. Uh, Asai, I'm going to go ahead and end the broadcast. If you could just stay on for just one moment. Sure. Uh, again, thank you so much for doing this. And everyone, if you could, uh, like and subscribe, and have a good day.